So I'd like you all to sit back and let us look at our lives as if we are on a, an aircraft flying 35,000 feet above the ground. And let us extract ourselves from the hustle and bustle of the world we are in and look at it all from high up. Now, you've all been on a plane and you've all looked down at the tiny human structures and lights below. Let's do that now with the view to looking at life in this material world, the big picture, from that vantage point. What are we doing here in this material world as individuals and as a collective human race? What are we doing? And last week, I was standing in an open air mall and there were hundreds of people walking past me. It was a hot, sunny afternoon and something caused me to pause for a moment and just look at these people with a different eye than my normal mind your own business type of attitude. You go your way, I go my, we're all good. But in this case, I was looking at them with a very different lens. And it was a surreal experience. I felt like I was from another planet looking at human beings with a fresh eye. Who are these people, I wondered. And why are they so different, like beings from different places and planets for that matter? I saw tall people, thin people, fat people, people walking at different paces, chattering loudly. They were all of diverse skin colors and races. Some were dressed impeccably and some looked like they'd literally been dragged backwards through a garden hedge. Complete mess, their hair and dressing and all. Their mosaic of tattoos was also striking like mini art galleries. And as was the way they colored their hair and presented themselves, their behaviors were also so different. What did they have in common, I asked myself. They were all human beings, but past that, all I could see was diversity, pure diversity. Then I spent a few more moments looking at them and I started winding the clock back in my mind and watched all these people become younger and younger and younger until they were all finally newborn babies, hundreds of them, newborn babies. Now, most of their differences were gone. They all seemed equal and one. That's how they started life in this material world. They came from oneness as souls and after manifesting, still projected that oneness at birth. And then each one went on a journey of their own along a path of their own. And no two parts of any one, any being was the same thus creating endless differences in all aspects of their beings, physically, mentally, emotionally, and more. Now, what I just observed raises an important question about our lives here in this material world. Why do we all start as one and then evolve with complete diversity as individuals? Is that part of how this world was designed for us? To take us from oneness to diversity. Clearly, that's what I saw was happening. So I asked myself, why is this the norm of life in our world? Why is this the norm of life? And my dear friends, we all went through the same process of birth into this material plane a process filled with pain and challenges from our nine months of confinement in the womb of our mother, absorbing all her emotions, hearing her thoughts, feeling her happiness, anxiety, hurts, and more. And there is how we spend nine months in confinement, but comfortable. And then finally, here we are, after birth, popping out, and we are now little babies. So this is an experience common to us all, without exception. When we were born, 
we were all completely innocent, knowing nothing of what lay ahead in our journey. There are also some remarkable factors that we need to consider here about each of us. Firstly, that each one of us has a distinct identity of our own. No two people can have the same identity as beings. Why, we may ask. There are certain things that are mind-bogglingly unique to each one of us, like our fingerprints and the lines on our palms. No two people have the same fingerprints or palm lines. No two people have the same DNA. And there is over 8 billion of us here on this planet. Why, we may ask. All these unique elements are so absolutely perfect. No random statistical coincidence could possibly create such a phenomenon. Is there a design and purpose behind them? There has to be. So let us keep these questions in our minds as we journey forward. And yet, my dear friends, when you look at babies, there is an immense sense of equality about them. Yes, their features may vary a bit, but they all have that same energy about them that emanates from the soul, an energy of equality. Is that also part of the design, we may ask? Then as babies grow up, in their, their differences also grow rapidly, their physical bodies evolve completely in different ways, their attitudes and emotions and thoughts evolve in completely different ways. At birth, we are all like a clean white sheet of paper. And from there, we all set out on our individual parts, each one of us. We begin to write the story of our lives, chapter by chapter. Is that one of the reasons why we are here in this world? To write our own individual story? Is that why we have these completely unique and differentiating features like fingerprints, palm lines, DNA? Are they present to distinctly separate one author from the rest of his or her eight billion counterparts? That would make sense, wouldn't it? There can be no plagiarism in any of the eight billion stories because the distinctions of each author are absolutely clear and stark. Now let us explore this thinking further. If we go back to my experience in that open air mall again, and if we were to stop each person and ask them about their lives, each one would have a different story to tell. Every single being on this planet has his or her own story to tell. Why is this so, we may ask? Is that also part of the design of life here? Think about it from 35,000 feet above, looking at your own life. In the final analysis, what is your life really all about? It is nothing more than a story, my dear friends. Nothing more than a story, plain and simple. It is not your wealth your fame, your fortunes, your possessions, your loved ones, nothing, because they are all temporary. Literally what you are is a story, nothing more. A story that will be forgotten a few years after you. Once you leave, and, and even while you are living here today, the world only sees small parts of your story. And then it all fades away into the ether after you. And what does your story comprise? It is made up of endless contrasting experiences, such as happiness and sadness, elation and grief, trust and betrayal, acceptance and rejection, success and failure, love and hate, peace and turmoil, unity and individuality, wealth and poverty, abundance and scarcity, loneliness and companionship, fulfillment and emptiness, courage and fear. 
And this list is endless. Actually, we may never be able to fill this list completely, even if we all got together and tried. This is what our stories make up. Or it's a mosaic of contrasting experiences. We are all precisely recording all our events and experiences and everything we have learned and felt during our stay here in this world. That's our story. And that, my dear friends, makes us first class authors. Congratulations. Now, is this all part of the design of life here in this material world? Now let us dig deeper into our story, the how and why parts. Let us start with the how part. So while we're still looking from 35,000 feet, we are allowed to imagine now. So imagine if you were to be born on this planet alone with no people, no buildings or human creations, no trees, no animals, no nature, nothing. Imagine that. Just you in open space with nothing of a material nature in this space. You are nothing else. You and nothing else. Let us call it the zero space. You are in the zero space. Could you write a story? Remember, nothing happens around you. Zero experiences. It's as if time stands still. Could you write a story? I think most of us would agree the answer is no. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit of a sobering realization, but the answer is no. All these things we have taken for granted, you know, are all gone. We can't write a story. Now in this zero space, to be kind to you, I add nature and no other human beings. And this nature provides you with everything you need. And there is no risk or danger or anything to worry about. Now could you write a story? The answer is yes. Would it be the same as your story is today? I would say no. It would be a much, much simpler story. Now, I scatter some Stone Age men and women and children now around you. And you're all in this ultra kind nature where everything is safe. What would your story look like? A little less simple than it was before. The Stone Agers arrived. And now more evolution kicks in. And the Stone Agers become a little more complex. They have now learned greed, control, and a small handful of the aspects of human nature as we know it today. Your story gets a little more colorful because you are experiencing more types of events. Now, we add predators and risk and danger into nature and the forest around you. And you experience fear and your survival instincts kick in. So now the human beings around you, the stone natures have all become smarter. All their characteristics are showing and now the, the, the forest you are in has also become dangerous and risky. Now your story gets even more colorful and complex. Now, we fast forward the clock and evolution has led us to the world we are in today with all its complexities, all the good, all the bad, all the ugly, everything, pure chaos with time racing beyond you. Now, your events are like the way you know them today. Your experiences are extremely complex and diverse. Your thoughts and emotions are in overdrive in all directions. People around you are endlessly diverse like the ones I saw in that open air mall. Now your story has become really interesting, fascinating I would say. Is that why our world started in a simple way first and then the different and increasingly complicated ages followed after? step by step. Is that why? For example, there was the Ice Age, then the Stone Age, 
then the Bronze Age, the Renaissance Age, Space Age, the Atomic Age, and the Internet Age, etc., etc. And in the midst of all this, religion, traditions, cultures, political control, and superpowers all creep in in an ever growing mesh. The severe unequal distribution of resources, injustice, and more. And now I'm running out of words to describe today's age. The quantum age and age of spirituality are some that come to mind. Was this all part of the design of life? From the beginning to all the ages through to today. I think our entire human and planetary history now makes more sense. They have made our stories deeper and more complex, step by step though, not suddenly. And the complexity has grown in parallel with our intellectual development. This is very important. The complexity has grown in parallel with our intellectual development. You see, there is perfect logic to all this now when you look back at history. Now we can also see the deep role human history plays in our lives. History is not the way we view it today, it should not be. It is not just things that happened in the past that we visit when, necess when necessary or when we are curious and then just move on. History is not out there. Today we park history away in some slot in our minds. But in reality, history is living with us every moment and history is being created with us every moment. It is the cause of the nature and complexity of events we are experiencing. So my dear friends, history plays a fundamental role in each one of our stories. Why is this so? Because history is a product of evolution. And this evolution creates more intricate and complex events. I know from the late 50s and early 60s to today, complexity is just shot up right before my eyes and before your eyes. So this evolution creates intricate and complex events for all of us to live through and experience. Therefore history and evolution make our stories evolve. Today's events and experiences would not be the same if our history were different or if evolution had not occurred the way it did. Like I showed you how from zero space came the Stone Age men, came this, came that, came that. That history caused the events to evolve. It would be very different if evolution had not occurred the way it did. So my dear friends, we have to rethink the role of evolution. It is not just something that only impacts nature and our physiology. It is far more than that. Evolution actually governs the content experience and direction of our story. Content, experience and direction of our story. It is a fundamental part of our journey here in this world. And my dear friends, evolution does not occur in isolation. Our actions and experiences create new history every moment. Hence they also influence evolution equally in the opposite direction. So our story each one of us is a direct contributor to history and evolution. Whether you, it's in the 1920s, during the First World War, Second World War, right through today, each one of us is a direct contribution to history and evolution. We are so much more connected to them than we thought, right? This raises important questions about the quality of the content each one of us through our lives adds to our history and evolution. What is the quality of content we are putting in history and evolution? Because each one of us is contributing to it. My dear friends, it boils down to the quality of our thoughts and actions. They govern our story. And the stories of all others in this world, now and in the future. So think about your thoughts and actions and the powerful influence they have and we will come back to this question later, but 
Think about it. Your thoughts and actions have an extremely powerful influence on history, on evolution, on your fellow beings, on everything, on the whole story. Now, my dear friends, I think we can appreciate a few things that we need to write our story, such as other people and the entire human race. They really make our stories work. Nature, science, art, intellectual development, and a myriad of contrasting events and experiences that our story, that make the story our way they are it is today. So this is the how part. And as you contemplate it further, it will become more clear that life in this world is designed to give us growing and diverse experiences. And that is one of the reasons why things happen to us the way they do. And of course, there are more such reasons, but that is one of the important ones. This brings us to the why part. So to understand the why part of our story, let us start with the cycle of life, which we have all discussed many times to date, but today you will see it in a different light. So the cycle of life is the origin is light, light brings life, life brings experience, Experience brings knowledge, and knowledge is light. That is the full circle of light. The origin is light, light brings life. Life brings experience, experience brings knowledge, and knowledge is light. So we come into this world, we start life like the ray of the sun. And you know you can tell the ray of the sun apart from its source because it is not as bright. But as we gain knowledge and light, this ray becomes brighter and brighter until at one point you cannot tell it apart from its source. And that is the completion of our journey from stage one to past the 10th stage of our soul. So now we can understand the cycle of life on the why part. So my dear friends, we are all here to gain experience and knowledge both of which are an integral part of our story. We come back to the story. As I've explained in webinars, previous webinars on karma, I think we have done four webinars on karma, and please do revisit these videos because we covered a lot of ground. Before we are born, each one of us at a soul level chooses what we want to experience and learn to complete our cycle of gaining knowledge and hence light. So we choose what we want to learn. So in fact, we have scripted the story we wish to live through and learn from during our short stay in this material plane. So our soul has scripted it. We have scripted our story. Now we come into this world to experience it. This triggers the flow of events and experiences that are presented to us so that we can learn from them and gain the specific knowledge that we are seeking and thus write our story accordingly. But it doesn't work that way. There's a catch. The catch is that each one of us is blessed with the power of thought and intellect that we draw upon to make our choices. Our thoughts, as I've said before, are living seeds that flow from us to all those around us, near and far, triggering events and experiences that flow back to us to make up our story. However, the quality of our thoughts, actions, and energies that we release directly influence the nature and quality of the events we are to experience. So if we are derailed, even though we have a script, we are derailed by our ego, for example, and live through power trips, influencing the lives and stories of so many others in unique and often diverse ways, and often adverse ways. Our events grow in the direction that feeds our ego, and our story becomes one of succumbing to the ego and relishing the experiences of power trips. No soul ever chooses to go through nine months of confinement in that womb of the mother and a painful birth to come here and write a story on how good validation, power, and ego feel. No soul does that. It is a valueless story with very little growth in knowledge. 
Yet some people spend their most precious time on this earth doing just that. So when we are looking at ourselves from 35,000 feet, let's start now digging up about ourselves. And my dear friends, not all of us end up writing the story that our soul sought to write. And this is a sobering realization. We don't always achieve what we came to achieve. And so our soul sought to write and gain a certain knowledge which we may or may not achieve. Many of us end up wasting the opportunity of this lifetime only to have to manifest again in one of the seven worlds to correct our course. And for those that strive on ego trips, I have some bad news. The shelf life of your story is very short in this world. When you leave, some may remember you for a few years, but in one generation, and if you are lucky, maximum two, it will almost be as if you never existed. Now this is true for everything. For example, many of us today choose to live by what people think of us and our actions. Everything we do is driven by what they think. But on all these people, we waste our valuable life journey, whereas they are all like us, and we are wasting our life journey on people just like us, who are here for a short time, and then forgotten very quickly, like the dust that blows away in the wind. So I would say, live by what you think of yourself, the quality of you, the content of your story, the light of your knowledge, rather than the dust particles that blow by never to be seen again. It's so futile, yet we all do it. Now, ego and validation are just two examples of how we write the content of our story. There is a myriad of other aspects of life and everything about our nature influences the content of our story. So let us be very wise about what content and what knowledge should be embedded in our story. As I mentioned in previous webinars, we live in a world where learning occurs through examples. It is called exemplary learning. The examples we set through our thoughts and actions influence others, both positively and negatively. Equally, we are influenced by the examples others set before us. That's how the wheel of learning turns in our world. So once again, how we think, how we act, how we live, has a direct bearing on the content and knowledge value of our story. While we are introspecting our stories, let us also explore another relevant point of the global affairs in our world today that we are all witnessing and experiencing and consumed with, such as the absolute pursuit of power and control by nations, leaders, corporations, groups of people and their ideologies. Number two, greed and conflict-driven agendas that are causing the wars we are seeing and the tragic loss of innocent lives daily before our eyes in the Middle East, in Russia, Sudan, other parts of Africa, Asia, in America, the rest of the world. Number three, the double standards of nations, leaders and institutions we once looked up to being clearly displayed in an unjust way when it comes to respect for human life, law and societal order, racial prejudice, injustice, etc. Standards which we all grew up believing in, those of fairness, justice, sanctity of human life, empathy and more. Number four, complete moral bankruptcy in our world order and leadership and more. So this sums up where we are today, right? Now let us look at why are we experiencing all this? Because now as we understand our story, now and we understand we have come here to gain knowledge and light, now let us ask ourselves, why are we experiencing all this? And what are we supposed to do with this experience? This is very important. I would say, those of us who are living and witnessing this particular era in 2024, came to this world seeking to learn about, amongst other things, trust, 
values, morality, and the transcendence of conflict, which is the cornerstone of stage eight of the 10 stages of the soul. This is the stage of the orchestra where every instrument plays in complete harmony. It is the stage of zero conflict, which is very difficult for souls to cross. Please view the videos on this stage and the 10 stages of the soul. So transcendence of conflict is a very big part of the era we are in, and this is what we have come here to learn. Now, all this was part of the script of learning we chose as souls, and here we are, born in this era, witnessing and experiencing it all first hand. Exactly what we chose to learn, we are now witnessing and experiencing it first hand. Exactly what we sought to learn. Now, this raises the question, what are we doing with these experiences and how are we reacting to them? Some of us are reacting with anger, exasperation, desperation, hopelessness, rebellion, thirst for revenge, cynicism, hatred, and more. But these reactions or responses may not be the point of why we took birth here, especially to encounter these very experiences. They may not be the reason at all. And if the above negative reactions make up the core narrative of our story, what does it tell us as souls? It tells us that we probably haven't really learned from the script we chose and are contaminating our stories with negativity and valueless learning. All this negativity that is spiraling around us, we are taking it in, we are becoming it, and we are flowing with it. And then we become contributors to the already negative spiral in our world today. Those negative reactions of our state produce exactly this. It tells us we have missed the point and that we may have to come back in one of the seven worlds to experience similar events to ultimately derive the actual knowledge we sought. Now I keep mentioning seven worlds. We, there are, we have videos on our YouTube channel on the seven worlds. I've covered a few of them, but if you have time, do look at them because we manifest in different worlds to gain different experiences. We are in the third world, which is the world of water. So now we have looked at our negative reactions. Alternatively, for some of us, these very experiences may reinforce our knowledge of differentiating between right and wrong and the value of doing the right thing, good and evil, and having the wisdom to choose what is good by correctly identifying what is evil the value and care of compassion and generosity towards those in suffering. These experiences cause some of us to experience deep empathy towards the plight of our fellow beings. We feel it and we hurt us, but it's our empathy coming out of us from our souls. Or deriving first-hand lessons of trust and its value, seeing it completely washed in front of us. So we are now getting first-hand lessons of trust and its value. And when trust is gone, then you realize how valuable it once was. Feeling the deep, pure, and innate call to prayer for the well-being of our fellow creation and for the alleviation of suffering, we have all felt it. There are a lot more we can add to this list, but you can see a completely different reaction to the very same events. And some of us may go even further and proactively think peace, promote peace in all our communications and actually work with their individual and collective consciousnesses to end the spiral of negativity and, and conflict. The same applies to trust, values, justice, honesty, etc. This is exactly what we've been doing in our shift group for the past 20 plus years, holding global meditations, trying to reach human consciousness and creating that change. Plus the sharing hope meditations, we all get together and perform once every month for the betterment and alleviation of the difficulties of our fellow beings and the, to bring an end to wars and conflict. So these are some of the proactive things some of us do. So, I believe this is one of the reasons we were born in this era. We chose the experience, we received the experience, 
but we are all reacting differently. And some of us are completely losing the plot, some of us are somewhere in middle, and some of us are getting it right. So now we can see from 35,000 feet below how this plays out. So my dear friends, these 10 positive elements in our stories that I've just pointed out, they project understanding, sincere reflection, and knowledge that is light. Those of us who get it may tick the boxes of learning and never have to return to facing such experiences again. We will move on to new ones instead. Sadly, those of us who didn't get it will have to come back again into such an era. And I would ask the question also in addition to that, how many of us have looked at all the terrible things going on in the world and asked ourselves, do I embody any of these negative traits in my being? How many of us have done that? Do I embody any of these negative traits in my beings, even at a much smaller scale? This is global scale, but at a much smaller scale, do I embody it? Now that I witness the consequences of greed, hunger for power, dishonesty, prejudice, double standard, brutality, I witnessed it all. And I see it all play out on a global stage before my eyes. Have I done something similar at a smaller or micro scale in my own life? Very, very important question. Are they part of my story thus far, even in an watered down version? Because I came here to gain these experiences and if I have adopted them, now is my chance to get rid of them. Remember, even mega scale global events have small roots. They all have very small roots that could easily be present in us. Now it is time to identify them through introspection and work to get rid of them. Great opportunity. My dear friends, we have to jump or be thrown in water to learn to swim. This is a fact. Similarly, we have to witness conflict in its midst to learn how to transcend it. That's why we are witnessing conflict. So living in today's era and experiencing all this turmoil should be triggering such questions in our minds. So to conclude the why part, the key point I wish to emphasize is that we have to be discerning about how we approach and react to these pretty harsh and disheartening experiences. We need to reflect on them, contemplate them, pray over them, act on them, and influence human consciousness to create positive change. We need to learn from them whatever is of real value and thus convert these experiences to knowledge which is light. And then we never have to experience such things again. We've experienced new things. This is the wiser approach. Rather than immediately reacting to our emotions, then forwarding it to everybody else and putting them in that same space, and then sitting helplessly, unable to do anything about it, feeling even more angry. And all we are doing is we are fueling and spreading more anger and negativity. And many of us are doing that today. Not because we know we, you know we want to. We are humans, our emotions are invoked and we are acting. But at 35,000 feet above, it's telling us, no, that's, that's not why you are here. That's not the picture. That's not your story. Don't do it. So that's not why we chose to be here in these times and live through these events. Something to consider. And I've only picked a few examples here for reflection, but please do contemplate this regularly with situations, events, and experiences that may reveal to you why you are present in this negative area, era, because you will also, from your own life journey, say, oh yeah, I, I, these are things I really need to work on, I need to learn, and how best you can learn from it. This is a good time to think about it. Now let us move to the final part, which is, what next? We have considered why we are here and how our stories are written. So what happens to our individual and collective stories when we leave this material plane? This is where it gets more interesting. In my experience and understanding, each story becomes embedded in our soul memory. Each story 
becomes embedded in our soul memory. Now this soul memory actually exists in the very life energy that flows through us and leaves when we die. And so how can we better understand soul memory and where it resides? Basically, we only use 10 to 12% of our mental capacity, most of us, and for geniuses, maybe 15%. So where does the balance 85% reside? It is in the superconscious mind, which I've explained in much detail in the Superconsciousness Masterclass series two years ago. There are 10 webinars and the videos are on YouTube, but I would, I would recommend you visit them now because we have all grown so much in our understanding that those will now make greater sense. In simple words, our story is not lost when we die. It lives with us in our soul memory. This is why when people undergo regression therapy via hypnosis, it doesn't actually take them back into their past lives. No, they're sitting right there with you. It simply opens the conscious mind to the soul memory where your entire story exists. So hypnotic therapy does take you there and you do see and experience things. They didn't go back in time You're exactly where you are, but you are now looking at your soul memory. You are looking at your entire story. Now the soul memory can have some very significant implications for each one of us. Let us take, for example, someone who fills his or her story with egoism, vanity, jealousy, illusions of power, hatred, conflict, deceit, theft, killing either directly or being complicit in it and more. Such a person actually ends up with a very dark story at the end of his or her life, which becomes what I call in inverted commas a living liability, an ever living liability that may actually, actually take them a few steps backwards in their spiritual journey up the 10 stages of the soul. So what we do in our lives, our deeds and actions, either become ever-living assets or ever-living liabilities. While we are in this world, there are living assets and living liabilities which we can grow and diminish what we choose. So the slate is not automatically cleaned when we die. We take our dirty laundry with us. I'm sorry to tell you that. As we do the light, we have gained. I'm glad to tell you that. Now, what happens next? I believe that each soul learns from its story and seeks a new opportunity to set things right and then to continue to grow higher in knowledge and light as it started from the moment the soul actually came to being. It is all there in its script. And so the soul comes back, manifests again multiple times until it reaches its ultimate abode beyond the 10th stage. Many schools of thought talk about karmic records and they give different names to these records. Well, my dear friends, they are in fact the stories you have written about you, which are ever living and ever evolving in your soul memory as you journey from stage to stage up the 10 stages. In some manifestations, you may drop downwards because of the story you have lived and written. And in others, you may raise higher, rise higher. So it's not a one-way direction. You can go down and you can go up. All depends on your thoughts, actions, their quality, and how you live your life and what you did with the experiences that were presented to you that you completely missed. So my dear friends, many scriptures talk about heaven and hell and the day of judgment. Well, I believe it is all in our very own story. Heaven and hell are lived through our journeys. And the one who judges your story is not an angel somewhere, it is in fact your own soul the soul that seeks to continuously perfect itself. That's what judges your story, your own soul. Hence, it keeps journeying from stage to stage until its goal is achieved. It is seeking that perfection. I think this makes the whole concept of karma even more clear. 
All the points that I covered in the four webinars on karma, they all fit together perfectly with this new understanding we have discussed today. Purpose of life also now falls into a much, much clearer regime of understanding. It makes more sense. Hence, in conclusion, what can we all practically do from here? I would suggest the following. One, look carefully at your own history and evolution and that of the world and draw an understanding of the role they play in your own story. They live constantly with you, so don't park them away in your mind's closet. Make them a beacon or a guide for you, your history. Number two, examine your story thus far and recognize what needs to be done to correct your course. This is a great opportunity of a lifetime to do that because you can clean up your story while you're alive in this world by taking steps such as seeking and giving forgiveness, making things right by those you may have wronged, and if they are no longer alive, by praying for their forgiveness, find that resolution within you where you recognize your error and sought forgiveness because that's how you perfect your story, you clean your chapters, by giving back what you may have taken that is not yours. And if this is not possible physically, then return its full value through charity. Put it back in the river of abundance. Devoting time to prayer and reflection and living with guidance from higher levels of your being, the soul. Changing the way you think, your attitudes, prejudices, racist thinking, your self-center, you can change them all because you have the opportunity. And you can create your own list as it pertains to your own story. So these are some of the steps that can help clean our slate so that we don't take these living liabilities with us when we depart. Next is recognize the role that is being played by everything you encounter and every person you meet in the writing of your story. They are all important. And give them the due recognition and respect they deserve. Avoid being oblivious and consumed in your own little world. Every encounter has meaning and value. Don't let it slip by you. Next, respect diversity, for it is a cornerstone of your existence in this world. Your diversity is a cornerstone of your existence in this world. Therefore, diversity is strength. You are unique and diverse beyond definition. So respect the diversity of others and abandon your exclusive attitudes, prejudices, and biases, because all they do is contaminate the richness of your own diversity, richness that you should be reflecting in your story. Next, abandon ego trips and power and living by what other th others think, for that is all short-lived and forgotten like the dust in the wind. What matters the most is what you think of you, for you are the author of your own story, nobody else's. So you govern the quality of your story. Number six, everything that happens in your life is no coincidence and neither is the world or everybody conspiring against you. Nothing like that is happening. Things happen the way they do because of your thoughts and creations. They happen because you have chosen to experience the eras you are journeying through now. And that's why you are living in today's circumstances. So take the right lessons from each experience and avoid reactions that spiral ever increasing negative tides that can ruin your story. Number seven, take time to contemplate, to pray, to meditate, for they open you up to higher levels of your intellect, where you will find guidance, gratitude, wisdom, and inspirations that enrich your story with knowledge and light. And finally, Think before you act or react. Ask yourself, what kind of author will that make me? Remember, you want to write the best possible story
that fits the script you chose as a soul before birth here. After all, your story can be an eternally living liability or asset. And now that you know this, you have the choice to do the right thing. So I would like to wrap up today's webinar with a prayer that you may always be guided by the Creator to live and fulfill the growth and purpose you came to this world to achieve, to acquire the knowledge you came in this world to achieve. I pray you may find much help and fulfillment at every step of your journey. And finally, I pray that you may all rise in your spiritual journey and reach and become the light that lies beyond the dance stage. So these were the thoughts I wanted to share with you. Thank you all for being here and please do share today's insights with others as well so that they can benefit from it. Take them to 35,000 feet above as well. Stay blessed and we look forward to seeing you again soon.